Hi Nicholas, we're excited to do a follow-up podcast with you to learn more about your career and your writings and um, everything in between. So uh, just a quick um, uh, recap, could you tell us about a bit about yourself and what do you do today? Um, I lead uh, digital and analytics at McKinsey. Um, I founded McKinsey Analytics a couple of years ago and uh, I'm also the chairman of Quantum Black, which is our data science and data engineering outfit. So you divide time across both McKinsey and Quantum Black? That's correct. Okay, wonderful. So you know, I want to dive straight in. You wrote a brilliant article for the Harvard Business Review, which talked about uh, data translators and um, uh, other folks who have sit in between people who are technical and non-technical. Could you introduce that concept to the audience? Yeah, I think the uh, uh, idea of a translator is somebody who is um, Deep, deeply knowledgeable about how data science and um, uh, analytics is used in order to improve business performance, uh, often in a particular domain. So a lot of companies have the following struggle. They, they would like to scale uh, analytics and AI. Um, uh, the opportunity is often quite distributed, uh, i.e. in a you know, steel plant in many, many process steps or uh, parts of the factory or even you know, different types of assets, uh, different types of products. So it's a distributed opportunity. And uh, in theory, you want to deploy hundreds of use cases across an entire business, which is very distributed. And uh, you can't essentially afford to have AI teams everywhere. And um, so you need to somehow have a trans uh, transmission between whoever runs the business, uh, i.e. The, the, you know, for example, the engineers in the plant or the um, uh, sales reps uh, or sales managers and and the analytics efforts and and that is uh, what we think um, a lot of leading companies are doing they're training um, training up essentially um, their staff their own staff uh, in order to become proficient enough to understand the outputs of machine learning AI and tools some of them are even getting trained on on modeling themselves and um, uh, work essentially in collaborative uh, cross-functional teams with um, um, AI experts, machine learning, data scientists, uh, production engineers, uh, scrum masters and so on in a, in a collaborative way around certain business problems so that uh, if you scale this um, that in a company you might have thousands of different translators who work on business problems uh, who ever get support from a small center of excellence, which may only have hundreds of people or even less. Uh, in some kind of smaller companies, maybe even tens of, you know, just a dozen of, 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 of technical people who work with a broader group of, of, of translators around. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned that even McKinsey is trying to, you know, do the same and has already started creating data translators within. Absolutely. So what we have um, uh, done, essentially we are on a, on a journey to, 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 uh, to train our own colleagues uh, in this and we have taken thousands of people through a formal training uh, where uh, we provide them with um, um, the tooling and, and the understanding uh, of how they can apply that. And um, the way how we describe the profile of a translator also in McKinsey is essentially people who are often having a STEM type background. However, they are you know, maybe experts in a particular area like banking or uh, supply chain or um, marketing. And um, uh, all it is is, is they then uh, learn uh, analytics techniques uh, to apply them to their particular environment and they become good at the domain but also at, at uh, understanding the outputs and working with data scientists. In some cases they go then to the level of uh, writing either composing code or writing code themselves. Um, that depends on, on, uh, on area. Like right. in risk modeling for example that is quite frequent. I see. Um, what I found really exciting about the article was that uh, it mentioned that there'll be two to four million uh, jobs that will be created in da as data translators. Now that's a huge new category, and uh, it's it's something that uh, less people are less number of people are thinking about. Are there more kinds of jobs or new kinds of sectors which will open up, uh, which will lead to more jobs? Because somehow the notion of jobs in AI always comes up, and uh, I'd love your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, I think you could study uh, some of the work the McKinsey Global Institute has done. They have done quite a lot of work on the frontiers of AI and uh, what it means. Um, um, we have also done quite a few uh, publications on the future of work, and we are welcome to, to, to add these links to, to, to this cast. Yeah. And the, uh, um, on, on a high level, um, there is always quite a bit of focus on all the changes um, um, AI will uh, bring to certain uh, you know, professions. Um, and the kind of work I'm talking about uh, is looking at uh, that about um, um, a third of, uh, two thirds of the world's jobs will change by a third uh, over the next uh, decade. So it's a pretty fundamental shift. But it is balanced by, at the same time, as you are saying, by new profiles. And you know, if you think about the, the job of an app developer, didn't exist before you know this thing existed. Um, and uh, obviously, and that is only you know uh, a good decade uh, available at scale. Um, so um, other jobs which will um, um, that there will be a whole set of of. You know, cyber type jobs. There will be a, uh, a whole set of, um, of 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 behavior management type jobs, like like, um, uh, for example, to manage um, the, the consequences of, of the use of technology, um, which I think a lot of people have written about. There was a lot of papers this year at Davos on on this yeah. topic. When it comes, however, to the scaling of AI. I think the single most important question is, is not so much the technology and the code and the, the mathematical models. The, 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 at the end of the question, the, the, the end point of, of scaling technology or AI into companies is to improve performance. So the main the way how to how I would think about this is, is um, you know they have many companies have done lean and six sigma type improvement programs. And this just becomes the next toolkit. This is essentially, uh, if you want to be a supply chain manager, if you want to be a, um, a marketing manager or, or sales uh, sales leader in the future, you have to be able to use with uh, to work with these tools. Um, and and um, technology is kind of coming, you know, the way of of management because it will be ever easier to compose tools on top of existing. Platforms in order to you know improve certain business outcomes. So and that's that's the essence of uh, translator, and and I think that will be applied to almost any any kind of job where decisions are being made uh, from data, and that goes all the way from logistics companies which manage their network performance to banks who kind of manage customer and and risk uh, to uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies which which make the pharmaceutical clinical development more effective. So in, in all these areas, you will uh, simply as a, as a basic tooling in order to do your job, uh, to, to know the, the way how to, you know, uh, uh, analytics and AI works, you need to be able to interpret models, uh, you know, statistics, you need to be able to make sense of these things in order to do your job. So then that's, that's kind of the essence of, of what we think a translator is. You know, I know we discussed this briefly in Davos, but uh, what happens to the po po poets and artists if everything is STEM and everything is AI? Do they still have a role in the future? No, I, well, of course. Uh, actually, a more important role. Um, um, your, uh, we were in this discussion mostly focused on what do companies and enterprises and companies and governments do in order to scale uh, the impact uh, from analytics and AI. And then obvious, uh, obviously, they uh, there might even be more need um, um, for for completely different uh, professions um, um, in in a in a world where also productivity is, is is much higher and people have more time to to consume you know the outputs of what poets and and artists are producing. Right, you know your your career itself, your academic background is so eclectic. It was like deeply technical. Then you went to Harvard for an MBA. You're also a PhD. Um, I wanted to understand, once you've invested so much time in learning, um, how easy or difficult is it to unlearn? Because people say that one sector that will be redefined completely in the future is education, especially higher education. 
Do you have any thoughts on that? As a student, did you think you will be doing what you're doing today? No, not at all. It was obviously not foreseeable. Um, and um, I think the uh, one thing about myself and something on, on education, on, on, on my own journey, it's um, not an atypical um, development. Uh, when you work in a, in a very, uh, you know, um, inspiring professional environment like McKinsey where you, you are exposed to very smart people and very significant client problems and that's kind of um, never changing and ever accelerating. Um, you have essentially the ability to, to learn um, um, about particular industries or about particular problems so to speak uh, on the job uh, from, from day one and um, um, that is essentially a model of lifelong learning, which, which you know, um, um, and in my personal example, I, I learned a lot about how, how pharmaceuticals and, and healthcare is is uh, is working, and um, how to essentially, um, you know, from making drugs to you know selling uh, uh, and commercializing medicines to um, to how to make healthcare systems better and safer. Um, and then how to apply uh, data and AI uh, uh, as tools in, in that process. Um, so, and I think that's just an iterative experiential learning journey as you know, adults learn by experience, it's not by necessarily only by classroom. And I do think that education systems need to think about that kind of change. Um, um, for example, right now it takes 14 to 15 years to make a doctor uh, from you know, first year medical school to um, being a, a, a surgeon with license to operate as, 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 a, as a consultant uh, in, in the UK and other countries have similar length. And a lot of that time is actually the um, uh, absorbing facts and, uh, and, and uh, learning about particular substance of, you know, how chemistry works, how biology works, how physiology works and then you know and certain techniques like surgical techniques and so on that's kind of a 14 to 15 year journey if you think about the current speed of change um, you know some people think in 2029 uh, a singularity will arrive and um, you know by which time it probably there's very little point in, in learning all of chemistry as a, as a, as a, in a textbook form like learning the facts so to speak so universities will need to um, uh, get into more uh, experiential learning, into more um, technology-supported um, learning, less focusing on the, you know, memorizing of facts, um, more into adapting, working with technology and 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 dictionaries and libraries and and tools, in order to, um, to you know combine knowledge and and a particular problem or a particular technique. So. So, so I do think there is a pretty fund, uh, uh, fundamental change in education needed, um, which isn't helped by the way how education is funded, um, which is very kind of conservative. Um, you know, you, you've often spoken about public-private partnerships in both your writings about health and data science. What is the one challenge that you stumble into in different areas. It doesn't need to be specific to your clients here, but anyway, like what could we do to make public-private partnerships more effective when it comes to AI deployment? Um, I think there's two, there's two uh, uh, particular challenges. Uh, the first one is skills. Um, so, um, um, and the second one is trust, particularly when it comes to data. Uh, so taking the, those in turn. Uh, on skills, I think in order to um, work at the intersection between a public uh, services uh, system and a private uh, system, um, you have to essentially on both sides have essentially knowledgeable practitioners who um, are able to inter interact um, and 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 uh, agree uh, certain protocols or certain technologies or certain data sets and, and so on. And um, when it comes to, for example, the combination of pharmaceutical companies trying to work with healthcare systems or a combination of 
maybe uh, uh, telcos helping on global pandemic prevention. Um, but you, you run frequently into the issue that um, the technical teams on both sides don't find each other because the senior you know, government officials and the senior business leaders aren't quite knowledgeable enough how to, how to build this bridge between knowledgeable people on both sides. Pretty, uh, and, and, and that is partially uh, hardened by the fact that not enough organizations have these digital and AI capabilities which are needed for that kind of inter interchange. Um, the second one is, is trust on data, um, where you know, obviously uh, different continents uh, think about it differently, like you would find different mindsets in, in uh, Europe versus uh, the US, uh, uh, and for sure uh, versus China, in terms of um, privacy and regulations for data. Um, but more fundamentally, when it comes to the question of um, you know, um, making use of data in order to improve, for example, healthcare outcomes or, or public health, uh, as one example, um, it is um, fundamental trust building which is needed. Uh, for example, if, if you use, uh, if you want to pre uh, predict the next epidemic uh, and prevent it, um, it would be highly useful to, to pool all of the world's telco data and see where everybody is. And that, of course, is something the telcos between themselves will have a hard time uh, to do. So we are looking into technologies and ways to, to more selectively share data, but then also how to keep that safe um, and, and building ecosystems and, and governance structures in, in order to do such projects. Yeah. Trust is such an important part, especially it's made complicated because institutional trust is at an all-time low. Like, that's exactly right, and that's uh, um, hard to uh, hard to overcome. At the same time, we are seeing a lot of examples um, where um, progress is being made, and um, the, the the most significant examples are uh, in um, in B two B industries, value chain uh, changes like airlines and. Air, uh, their suppliers and even their customers sharing data in order to you know um, make the travel experience better you know over time you might you might actually board a plane without a passport uh, because uh, you know there is your digital identity uh, is, is linked to, to where you are and, and stuff like that. so the customer experience becomes better by selective sharing between you know security agencies airlines and airports uh, sharing data in order to make sure only people are going into a plane who should be going into a plane, make it safer and, and the customer experience better. Um, so that's kind of happening. And then of course there is uh, the, the, the B2C uh, platforms where, you know, which you, the technology pl uh, platforms which, which rely on essentially people sharing data about themselves in order to you know, create value for, for uh, uh, estimating their future needs and uh, ensuring they get efficient ways uh, uh, offering to them via advertisement and so on. So, and obviously there are um, um, more and more challenges to that uh, and, 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 and cyber, cyber and, and trust challenges um, in, in this field. Um, and uh, I would say in general that's a, that's a very kind of uh, immature, uh, early, we're in early days on this and, and more, you know, um, regulation and more responsible use of data is, is, is needed to improve. Do you think in the future people are likely to com give up their uh, privacy for added digital benefits? We are already seeing that, but do you think in the future it will be more or less? It's very hard to generalize. Um, I do think there will be um, very specific um, opportunities uh, where People will be quite happy with that in the case of somebody who is, for example, chronically ill and, 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 and needs to manage the condition. And um, they will probably be very happy with uh, sharing data, in particular, you know, with providers and others who, who need to have the data to, to, to improve outcomes. Uh, on the opposite end, um, uh, we will probably, um, it's, it's hard to speculate about these things, but we will probably see um, uh, challenges uh, where you know um, either um, um, 
criminal uh, abuse or or just uh, human error is causing um, you know challenges uh, to particular platforms you know so data get public which shouldn't be get public or data get shared with people who shouldn't be uh, using them and and as as these events occur uh, probably the, the there will be a general reaction uh, particular in in uh, in the west i would say I do, uh, probably china is slightly different right um we're just approaching the end i have two quick questions one is that for anyone looking at your career from the outside, it just seems like one glorious achievement after the other, lots of successes, but I'm sure there have been some challenges. Um, could you share one or share a learning from how you bounced back from one challenge, one such challenge? Well, of course, I think the, um, um, when you work in, um, in professional services, um, um, the single most important um, you know, metric that you actually do something useful is if if uh, if you have a lot of impact in your clients, and um, and over time, uh, particularly over a longer period in a career, uh, you kind of need to reinvent yourself a bit. If you just keep uh, keep doing the same thing, um, you you tend to become quite stale. So early days in my career, for example, I was very very uh, interested in. Um, in uh, pharmaceuticals, how they get made, and and how to develop molecules, and and spent literally quite focused time on on, on that. And I, I at some point found that I was quite good at it, and uh, worked with a client and had a good time. But um, at some point also realized that if you wish, um, it it became a bit uh, a stale. And what I then decided to do that to go to the complete opposite and just say. Um, Let's uh, change your. Op I say in healthcare, but I look at health systems. Like how is a country's healthcare system actually being run, and how can it be made uh, better? And I think the the main learning out of that uh, was it, it was actually quite helpful to to literally um, completely re reinvent and 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 uh, do something completely new. Uh, not overnight. Uh, it takes time. Um, but the beauty of a professional services environment like McKinsey is that you can do these shifts uh, in, a, in a gradual way. But after a couple of years, then also giving up the situations which you have been spending a lot of your life with. Um, so getting comfortable to, to, to leave things behind and moving on to something else uh, in, a, in a staged and managed way. Um, that is, I've done a few times and uh, it's not easy um, you be, because, you know, you always you have a destination, but you might not be yet the world expert on on the activity which is required in that in that new field. Um, but this kind of reinventing yourself, I think, is is a very important element of, of creating a, a sustainable and and also frankly exciting career. Yeah, wonderful. Last question. So basically, Network Capital is a global community of young people helping each other to make smart career choices. But it's very confusing, you know, Nicholas. Everyone has an opinion on careers. There's media telling us different kinds of things. Um, we want to know from you, if you were to give advice to somebody just joining the workforce or thinking about what to study, when to study, um, what are some principles that he or she should keep in mind for careers of tomorrow, building meaningful careers of tomorrow? That's a big question. I think the, 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 um, the first and Two or three things which 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 come to mind. The first thing is um, um, think as much about who you spend time with uh, 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 compared to with what you actually want to do. So you, your your learning and your development is is largely shaped from um, the kind of people you spend time with, the kind of organizations, problems, uh, countries, uh, situations you get exposure to. So managing the, the, the individuals, but also the institutions you have exposure to is incredibly important, uh, particularly at the early stages of career. So, so picking, uh, picking organizations which, which have a good uh, um, track record in developing people in, uh, and within those, uh, spending time with people who, who kind of are uh, on the same wavelength and, 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 and have an interest in, 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 in 
uh, developing people is, is, is probably um, one of the most important things to think about in addition to what you would be doing. In terms of the what you want to be doing, I, I do agree with a lot of people who say um, um, never create a job you wouldn't take yourself or um, you know, make sure you're spending time on things you actually are you know, having some kind of passion and excitement for. It. Um, there is um, a lot of very interesting uh, professional fields and, and I think finding, finding a niche in which um, you have personally some excitement and passion for is, is, is probably quite uh, important for, for you know creating the energy to 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 to, to contribute uh, at a, appropriate levels wonderful and keep reinventing nicholas from a very heavy uh, day in london thanks very much for your time we really appreciate it your interview will go out and reach thousands of people thanks very much for sharing your insights and for being there with us we really appreciate it thank you